As far as the recovery is concerned, and, and there have been many commentators talking about um, what type of recovery we're going to have, V, W, U-shaped, I'm, I'm hearing stories about K-shaped. Uh, the, the, the reality is, is that the, the heart of this crisis is, is a virus, and the only two ways that you're really going to get to the bottom of it, which is either through herd immunity or through a vaccine. Um, but the, the ability for economies to rebound has to be very, very powerful uh, once we come to the solution um, of either herd immunity or a vaccine. This is not like the 2008 crisis where you had a balance sheet um, stress that one needed to work through, which took uh, a decade. So in our minds, and, and for us, China has been um, the, uh, the guinea pig, if I can put it that way, or the, the first economy into the crisis, it's been the first economy out of the crisis. And so we would be in the, in, in the camp that the, the ability for economies to V-shape uh, is very, very high. The amount of stimulus that's been pushed into the system is extremely high at this point in time. There are three factors that we think um, are going to come post this or in, in, the, in, the, in the world post COVID because of COVID. And the first, the first is deglobalization. And this is going to be likely coming from the pri private sector. Um, and it's going to be coming from supply chains, which diversify and move back closer towards home. Uh, the reason we say that is the minutes that Wuhan shut down, we found that um, manufacturing plants across Eurozone, across the US were shut down uh, because of shortage of components, um, which left us with two, with two uh, confirmation of two areas of thought, which, which we thought had been in process. The one is that um, the world is very reliant on China uh, and the second is that um, there's very limited spare capacity within the global supply chain. It's something that we've been reading about, um, but we couldn't confirm until we experienced COVID. Now, the fact that the virus emanated from China, it's probably likely that the world is going to want to turn us back on China. Uh, it's a view that we've got some sympathy for. Uh, it's likely that corporations are probably going to want to bring their supply chains closer towards home. They would like to ensure that They've got resilience of product within, within their supply chain as, as opposed to just ensuring that they've got uh, the lowest cost of production. So that in itself, uh, reversing the, the global drive to, to move to lower manufacturing bases, we think could change direction um, of inflation from a supply side perspective. Number two, we think that technology um, and the adoption of technology, which is already in place, uh, is going to be accelerated. So things like Zoom, Teams, WebEx, uh, we've all adopted that technology very quickly, and this is courtesy of COVID. Um, and the movement and the investment into technology will continue to grow. And this is one area we do know that that China has got a very strong plan uh, and strategy uh, to develop their economy into becoming a technology powerhouse. And this is going to lead to greater geopolitical uncertainty uh, between the US or, or the West, in, for, for that matter, uh, and China. The final driver is, is the importance of government and how we've gone into a situation now where the, the pressure on governments to, in essence, revive economies or stroke, look after various industries which are under pressure um, has risen dramatically. So there's a far greater role that, that government is now playing within, within economies and within policy. So we're going to have to keep a very close eye on, on um, the, the direction of policy going to the future uh, relative to what we would have in the past. We think that bond yields are going to remain suppressed. Uh, you can see in orange how bond yields have moved on. This is just US 10-year treasuries where back in 2000, you could get a yield of six. Um, throughout 2000 through two, 2007, you could range between three and a half and 6% yield. You're now getting 68 basis points. Throughout that period, gold prices were rising. And you know the, the, the way we see it, it's, it's, it's very unlikely that bond yields are gonna be rising until we see some form of inflation coming through the system. Uh, we do think that the market is too complacent on inflation, um, maybe not in the short run, but certainly in the medium term. And therefore, interest rates, real interest rates, are going to, are going to remain very well, um, very deeply suppressed. So if the spot price holds of gold and the RAND holds, 
then this company is trading on a PE ratio of four and an EV EBITDA of 2.3 and a free cash flow yield of 21%. So that means this company is earning a quarter of its market capitalization in cash per year, which means that this equity is not priced in this current basket price. So we think there's upside to the equity without the basket price moving higher, but we think that the direction of travel on the basket price is higher um, until these drivers change direction. The other message we want to give to you here is that have a look at how little cash Harmony was generating from 2000 to 2020. That's the EBITDA, call it their cash from operation, somewhere between 2 billion Rand and 6 billion Rand until this year we'd had record 8 billion Rand. In a year's time, this company is going to make 23 billion Rand and 27 and 28, keeping the price of the metal flat, but as volumes come through. Now, this is very important for South Africa as a country because these mining companies now, once again, are making really good money. And that's going to filter its way through into the economy via wages, via services, via additional capital expenditure. And this is part of the reason why we're becoming more constructive on other equities within the South African universe. Same story with Goldfields, which is not that much of a South African company anymore. It's only got one operation here. But, you know, this is all in USD. Um, you can see how the profit streams are rising strongly. Traditionally, we would have looked at a mining company four times EV EBITDA would be low, eight would be average, and 12 would be high. And, and bear in mind that these, these are safe havens. You know, so if you showed me this as, a, as, a, as an ordinary equity, I'd say to you, that's a buy. But not only is this, a, you know, an ordinary equity, this is a safe haven. This is therefore that calamity. So they should be priced significantly higher than where they are at this point in time. So when we talk about you know, the platinum companies, and you'll often hear about people talking about platinum, just bear in mind it's platinum, palladium, um, erodium, and various other metals. And right now, platinum is probably about a third of the basket. Right? So don't just focus on the platinum price, focus on the palladium and, and, and rhodium price as well. Um, because of what Stephen was talking about, about precious metal prices being high, um, oil being low, we have very, very good terms of trade at the moment. We even have a current account surplus. And um, from an EM perspective, our currency is one of the cheapest in the world. And our bonds are super attractive, both on a relative and an absolute view. And at the moment, we've actually got one of the steepest yield curves um, in EM, to put it into perspective. If we had to go into some type of risk on environment, South Africa stacks up very, very well from an EM perspective. If you had a weaker dollar coming through, if metal prices hold, we are a commodity exporting country. So it would be very beneficial. From an internal perspective, um, I think what, what's key is we have a, a confidence crisis at the moment, and that's because of corruption, bottom line. At the same time, we don't have growth. So we need to really kickstart growth. And I'll, I'll talk you through some of those. But, you know, we have quite a bifurcation. If, if I look at how we screen from a global competitive perspective, our financial system sits out of 141 countries that they look at. South Africa sits 19, one nine. That's how strong our financial system is. That's because of the independence of our reserve bank. That's because of our policies from our reserve bank. Um, our legal system sits 13 out of 141. Very, very high. We have a proper constitution. Um, you know, it's something that, that's remained and, and protected South Africa during the uh, Zuma administration. However, if you look at our global poli our, our government policy, um, just as a proxy for the government, we're sitting at 108 out of 141. So that's where we, you know, we really fall short. From an external perspective, lower oil prices, higher metal prices significantly improves our terms of trade. Um, and it's because also we're paying far more taxes in the mining sector. What we haven't touched on is more the qualitative aspect. And that's because the mining sector is quite a significant employer, especially within the, the primary um, part of our market, and there's a significant multiplier effect. So for every miner who's employed in South Africa, he or she is supporting six to 10 individuals back home. So when this part of the market does well, when metal prices are high, um, and, and when there's incentivization to, to get production up and going, it goes straight back into our economy. The mining companies had to shut down under our level five lockdown. They lost a full month of production. Then they lost a further three to four weeks by ramping back up. They, they're almost back to about 100%, but they've lost about 25% of production 
you know, I'm talking quite broadly now across gold, across um, general mining, across uh, platinum. But what they're going to do to try to catch up that misproduction is they're going to be working through the month of December this year. China's rebounded, as Stephen showed you in the, the macro piece, very important for South Africa. China's our biggest trade partner and a, a significant consumer of commodities. If we saw US dollar weakness, a risk on environment, we stack up very well um, compared to our EM peer group. And we do have multilateral fiscal support. So about a month ago now, um, we were awarded about $4 billion um, USD from the IMF. It's a relief package, like I think a lot of emerging markets have accessed. What's very important is that under our South African democracy, so under an ANC-run government, which we've had over the last 24, 26 years, we have never approached the IMF. We did last approach the IMF in the 1980s, but that was during the apartheid regime. So this is the first time that the ANC has actually approached the IMF. And if you read through the fine prints of that document, it does come with conditionality. It's not free money. Um, it comes with a condition that we target a 4.5% inflation, or core inflation, um, and also that we, we, we implement what our national treasury presented in their supplementary budget about a month ago. And that comes with huge reform. We have to cut our public sector wage bill. We have to kickstart growth. And our first repayment to the IMF is in 2023 to the tune of a billion um, dollars. So it, it's around the corner. So it does come with con uh, some conditionality. And our, our key financial institutes, our treasury, as well as our South African Reserve Bank, were instrumental in getting access to that funding. From an internal perspective, we've been accommodative. Our Reserve Bank has cut interest rates by three percentage points since the beginning of the year. So for the upper end of the market, individuals that have existing debt through vehicle finance, through home loans, through credit cards, their debt is significantly cheaper. And if they have held onto their jobs through this lockdown period, if they still have good discretionary income or disposable income, they can take on additional credits. From a corruption clampdown perspective, and, and this is where maybe we differ a little bit from the rest of the market, is that, you know, the statements that you hear is corruption is still rough in South Africa. What happened during COVID was we still saw corruption come through. So relief funds, food parcels uh, were stolen. So individuals stole food from the poorest of the poor, to put it into perspective. And what, what's important here is that it put a lot of egg on the current administration's face because they came into this administration and, and you know, their key mantra is we are going to stop corruption. And it still happened underneath them. Corruption, it's important to, to not just measure the absolute, but also the, the, the travel, okay? This corruption was so significant and so deep that um, the only missing piece of the puzzle, most of our government institutions were gutted except our legal and except our financial. So the last piece of the puzzle for the Zoom administration was to um, take over the treasury, which he, did in he attempted to do in 2015 by replacing the then um, finance minister, and then to get their hands on um, our reserve bank. Then you can start doing a lot, okay? But they never got that far. Our legal system, our constitution, and the strength of our financial system protected us from that. If we were three years into this new administration and no institutions, other institutions had been repaired or improved or strengthened, I would argue that the corruption is too deep and you know, it's completely taken over. But there's some key parts of, the, of our revenue services, our prosecuting authority, and our hawks, which is the investigative arm of our prosecuting authority, where they've self-cleansed and they, they're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm.